there's a confidence that emanates from all of the military sources, but the everyday Israelis have been watching every single headline intensely over the last six months and recognize that Hezbollah has been able to hit military points in the north, and even the Houthis have been able to hit ships in uh, the Red Sea as yeah. well. And uh, so it's not a given that if uh, you are to uh, be attacked that you'd be able to shoot down everything, even though Israel has the world's one of the world's most advanced air defense arrays. The U.S. President Joe Biden has reiterated America's ironclad support for Israel's right to defend itself following threats from Iran. Iran's Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei said Israel must be punished, but Israel's foreign minister has warned of retaliation. Hamas's political leader also announced his three sons were killed by an Israeli airstrike, which the IDF has confirmed. There's a video circulating online where you see him finding out the news. He seemingly remains completely calm and carries on with his meeting. But you do have to wonder what's going on. Uh, Gabriel Weiniger is the Times correspondent in Israel and joins us now. Gabriel, good morning. Good morning, Callum. Shall we start, first of all, with President Biden and the warnings that Iran is threatening to launch a, a significant attack, is the quote, after the strike on the Iranian consulate in Syria. What more do we understand about the, I suppose, the extent, the level of this warning? Well, we've seen the US um, intelligence report that was first reported um, on Bloomberg warning of a major either missile or precision drone strike by Iran or one of its proxies against both military and government targets in Israel. That report was saying it's imminent, meaning that's going to happen in the coming days. As you mentioned, it's all in response to um, the Israeli attack on an Iranian consulate, um, which is also considered to be some kind of a revolutionary guards headquarters uh, in the Syrian capital of Damascus. But that was the first of its kind. And Khomeini, the, um, the leader of Iran, did say that this is essentially an attack um, on Iranian soil. So Israel has responded initially just with uh, comments from the foreign minister. We've seen Israel Katz reporting on, uh, tweeting on X. He said, if Iran attacks from its territory, Israel will, will respond and attack Iran. He wrote that in both Farsi uh, and Hebrew. What we know from the ground is that since April the 1st, Israel has been bolstering its defences and been on high alert for this precision drone strike. They've called up their entire aerial reservists um, from the army who are on leave. So all that unit is mobilized. Their embassies abroad are also on high alert. Um, and something that I've just been noticing on the ground um, from Israeli citizens themselves, they're not really traveling at the moment to places like Dubai and especially Turkey. Um, so th there's really what they're looking out for is attack from directly from Iran or from its proxies. Um, uh, Hezbollah in on the northern border um, from Lebanon, uh, the Houthis in Yemen who have been performing um, and conducting attacks on the Red Sea and disrupting the sea route there. Um, all of this, of course, kicking off since October, mm. um, since October the 7th. And the US vowing to stand behind Israel. Uh, we do know that Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallen and uh, the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke last night. Um, and Blinken reiterated his support and said that the U.S. stands with Israel against any threat by Iran on its proxies. What we can say for sure is any strike on Israel would certainly widen the conflict and um, draw in the U.S. and Iran and all its offshoots. I note that Israel hasn't claimed responsibility for the strike on the consulate, um, although you know consensus is that that is what happened. And I just wonder, Gabriel, if, if Israel would do that without you know, pricing in the potential consequences of an attack like that? It's difficult to say. Um, they haven't claimed it, but there has been allusions to it. And I think we're past the point where we can say alleged Israeli strike. Mm. You know, everybody knows that it was an Israeli strike. And uh, you suppose that they would, they would take that into account. They did kill two senior commanders and five other members of the IRGC. Um, you would think that they were taking the regional consequences and maybe they did. Maybe they did. In terms then of uh, other developments in the area, let's discuss the uh, killing of, um, well, the sons, three sons of Hamas's political leader in an Israeli strike yesterday. Uh, I suppose there's two things on this. One, what happened? And two, what impact will this have particularly on negotiations? Could Hamas derail negotiations as a result of the incident? 
Well, this is another one where you would ask, has Israel considered the implications yeah. of such a strike? Um, and in this case, Israel has confirmed that they assassinated three of Ismail Haniyeh's sons. He's the head of the political bureau of Hamas. He is currently in exile uh, in Qatar. Um, the army say that his three sons were on the way to commit some kind of a terror act. Um, we've also seen unconfirmed reports, at least by the army, that uh, sources on the ground in Gaza saying that three of his grandchildren <clears throat> excuse me, were also killed in this attack. They were all uh, in a car that Israel targeted. Um, they were driving to celebrate to families, to relatives, to celebrate Eid, which is, of course, the end of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. But this isn't such an unusual thing for Ismail Haniya. 60 members of his family have been killed since the start of the war in October, including his brother, who was killed in the early days of the war. Um, his sister, who lives in southern Israel, was also arrested um, earlier this month for collaborating with Hamas. Um, Haniya has insisted that this will not interfere with the ongoing negotiations that are being brokered by the US and Egypt and Qatar. But I think the wider fear is that this will throw off the talks. Um, they're currently in the stage where they're waiting for Hamas to respond to the latest proposal. So I suppose we'll see in this Hamas response whether or not this is going to affect the negotiations or just increase the potential for escalation, which, you know, it seems that this is the way it's heading. Yeah. In terms of um, what it does also, I was reading mm -hmm. your article in the World section of the Times today about tensions between Israel and the US as well, given President Biden's sort of stern words for Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel over the last, what, week to 10 days or so, I suppose now. Um, this idea of some sort of humanitarian truce, this idea that civilians need to be prioritised in Gaza. Um, sort of a sense of growing frustration from Biden aimed at Netanyahu. And I just wonder if this strike feeds into that conversation as well. I think it would. I think that Biden would, would say that this has potentially thrown off negotiations. Yeah. And we've heard, you know, increased criticism of Netanyahu. And he said some of his harshest things yet the other day. Uh, last, I think it was yesterday, actually. He said... Um, Israel's making a huge mistake in Gaza and he just doesn't agree with Netanyahu's approach. I think the peak of these deteriorating relations was the killing of the seven um, World Central Kitchen aid workers, um, where Biden then told Netanyahu to change course and allow more humanitarian assistance into Gaza. It's not clear if that's happening. Um, the UN and Israel give very, very different reports when it comes to how much aid is currently entering um, into Gaza. And we do know that some of the pledges that Israel's made, for example, opening the Erez crossing and the Ashdod port uh, to allow in more flour, it hasn't happened yet. And I spoke to the Israeli officials yesterday who were in charge of, um, of these things and, and they don't have a date for it. And actually, I know that Erez crossing is still in tatters from the October 7th attack and there's no plans to refurbish it. So it's not really clear whether or not that's that's going to happen and, and there's going to be more aid coming in. There's also the fallout over the potential Rafa operation with the US saying they have no knowledge of it happening soon, but Benjamin Netanyahu is saying we have a date. So there, there's all these points of tension and disagreements. Um, and, but what could happen is that this situation with Iran and, and US President Joe Biden vowing to stand behind Israel, they could push those allies closer together because Netanyahu has always insisted throughout his decades in leadership that Iran is the biggest threat. Hmm. Let's get some analysis from Steve Erlanger. He's the New York Times chief diplomatic correspondent for Europe. Morning, Steve. Good morning. Uh, good to speak to you. I mean, there has been a notable change in tone and message from President Biden over the last sort of 10 days or so. Uh, has, is he swinging back and forth, though? Is he, is he getting it right? Well, it's hard to know if he's getting it right, of course. That would be in in the pudding. Um, but he has influenced Netanyahu significantly in two ways. One, to let more aid into Gaza. And two, in these negotiations over a ceasefire, the Americans have actually put forward their own proposal, which is unusual. Hamas has been rejecting it, but is considering it. Biden very much wants at least this uh, six-week ceasefire to get more aid into Gaza. 
Hamas now says that under its uh, old rules, which would mean producing 40 live hostages of a certain category, I don't think there are 40 live hostages in that category. So Biden's a bit frustrated. But on Iran, Iran, he's been very clear. I mean, he, he has always supported Israel's right to exist, Israel's right to defend itself. And Iran is a big country. It's not Hamas. Um, and so I think it was a very important uh, message that he was sending to Iran, which is to be careful not just about what it does for retaliation against Israel, but against U.S. troops who are in the region as well. In terms of the potential for escalation here then with Israel and Iran, uh, we had the strike on the consulate in Damascus um, a few days ago by Israel. It strikes me that they wouldn't do that without factoring in something of a, you know, in inverted commas, cost of doing business, something of a response from Iran. Would there ever be direct hits one on the other? Or is it always on the kind of fringes of, of, of escalation, I suppose? Well, that's been uh, the deal so far, which is the fringes. Now, this building that was hit in Damascus, the Israelis say, wasn't the consulate, was a building next to the embassy. Uh, the Iranians say, no, no, it was part of our embassy, so it was our, our territory. So that changed the equation for the Iranians. Now, they're in a bit of a bind because they vowed from top down, the Supreme Leader down, to retaliate. But they need to retaliate in a way that doesn't provoke a much larger escalation or a direct Israel-Iran war. I mean, I don't think either side wants it. Iran certainly doesn't doesn't want it either. So uh, we'll see what they end up doing. I think they've said, we'll take our time, we'll think about it. In the meantime, they have Israel all in a panic, which is kind of part of you know, a sensible procedure for them. Mm. Um, but yeah, the risks of regional escalation are bigger. I mean, something could go wrong. There could be miscalculations. Something could land in the wrong place. It could, you know, a missile could hit a, a kindergarten and then who the hell knows what would happen. Yeah. But unusual for them to go public with this, something like this, isn't it? Well, this was a story in Bloomberg that was carried uh, yesterday. Uh, they quoted unnamed uh, US intelligence sources saying that they believe an, an attack by Iran uh, or one of its proxies in the region on, on Israel was imminent. This is in, in, in retaliation, uh, the Iranians would, would, would argue, for an attack by Israel uh, on a, a building, an annex of the Iranian embassy in Syria uh, early this month when a number of leading members of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps uh, were killed. At the time, the Iranians promised retaliation, they promised retribution. Um, and it's certainly true that there are fears among uh, the American intelligence community that those are not idle and empty threats. They are threats that, that, that the Iranians want to carry out. And does the, do the act of going public with it, I mean, you wonder whether it makes it more likely now because of will feel it's got to act. Well, possibly, but it also gives the opportunity, I think, for the administration, for Joe Biden uh, to stand up in public and uh, fire a, a, a shot across the bowels of the Iranians, if you like, by, by reiterating that American support for Israel's ironclad. I think the Iranians will be looking at the relationship between Israel and the US, and particularly between President Biden and uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, which has really soured in recent weeks over uh, Israel's conduct of the war. And, and, and I think the Iranians will think they have an opportunity to, to exploit that, that breakdown in relationship. I think Biden standing up and reiterating that, that uh, Washington's support, as he said there in the clip, is, is, is ironclad, will, uh, will, will, will serve, I think, the American purpose quite well. Why has the US made this warning public and how's it been received in Israel? That's a good question why they've made it public. I suppose they want to scare off Iran from making such an attack because they've stood very firmly and said, we are behind Israel. Um, Gallant, uh, who is the Israeli defense minister, and Anthony Blinken, the, um, the Secretary of State, spoke last night, uh, and Blinken told him the US stands with us against any threats by Iran or its proxies, and it stands with Israel. Um, so I think, in a way, it was an effort, some kind of uh, political rhetoric to to call for de-escalation and warn Iran off attacking Israel or for using one of its proxies, uh, Hezbollah, the Shiite militia in Lebanon, or the Houthis um, in Yemen, who have been conducting attacks on the Red Sea and disrupting the sea routes there, 
or indeed their proxies in Iraq and Syria um, who have been used to fight a proxy war against Israel for for years. Um, they also were behind a drone attack, if you remember, in early October um, in Jordan that killed three U.S. soldiers. They're, it's been tinkering on the brink of, of some kind of escalation for some time, but it, it, the U.S. is saying Israel needs to be on very high alert at the moment since April the 1st um, and the bombing of what Iran says is its consulate um, in the Syrian capital of Damascus, but Israel says it was um, a kind of Revolutionary Guards uh, headquarters. Um, so we'll have to see if, what's going to happen. I mean, everyone's on very high alert and Israel's definitely bracing for something. They've called up their aerial reserves, all of those people who were on uh, on leave. Um, there's a lot of drones you're hearing all the time in the sky in Tel Aviv. Um, so yeah, high alert for everybody. And the foreign minister is saying that if Iran attacks, uh, if Iran attacks from its territory, Israel will respond and attack Iran. I mean, that could could escalate pretty quickly, couldn't it? In what is already a pretty fraught part of the world. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Um, a strike on Israel would certainly widen the conflict, and not only that, it would draw in the United States um, and Iran uh, and all of its offshoots. Um, it, that was uh, Israel Katz saying that if uh, he's the foreign minister, that if Iran attacks on Israeli soil, uh, on Israeli soil, then Israel will attack on Iranian soil. But we did hear Ayatollah Khomeini yesterday saying in his, Ram in his Eid address at the end of Ramadan that the attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus was an attack on Iranian territory. Um, we also heard the Defence Minister Gallant, who spoke earlier with Blinken, as I mentioned. Today, he went to visit the Iron Dome system, which is a system that shoots down missiles coming in um, normally from the Gaza Strip, but potentially from other places as well. Um, Gallant said any attack on Israeli soil will warrant a, quote, very strong response in their territory, in Iranian territory. So you were saying earlier about uh, why the US has made this warning public. Uh, definitely, um, as we can um, hear and uh, see last week, uh, the American president was extremely like, um, determined to uh, convince Netanyahu government uh, to change its tactics towards Gaza. But at the meantime, I would say that the United States is using the carrot and the stick with Israel. In one side, uh, they were saying we'll stand by Israel if I came under attack from Iran as a village of the um, attacks on the uh, Iranian consulate in Damascus, where many Iranian revolutionary guards have been killed. So um, I would think that, you know, Iran is determined this time for so many reasons, because many of its uh, top commanders have been assassinated by the Israelis, uh, including the attack, it will take revenge enough for that. So I would believe and uh, convince that Iran is determined because of its reputation that so many Iranian leaders has been assassinated by Israel and not a single uh, revenge as the promise that has taken place. So uh, we can see as well the statements by pro Iranian militias in Lebanon, in Yemen, in Iraq, and Syria are all talking about a serious Israel uh, Iranian, uh, you know, attack on the very uh, important facilities in Israel. So uh, I couldn't quite hear everything you said there, but what are you saying? You're saying, well, first of all, if, if the Iranians directly strike Israel, that will be a significant escalation. But your perception is that they won't do that. They will use proxies. Uh, well, probably, yes. The proxies already, they are getting daily attacks against Israel. That it is not going to make any difference. Because every day we can see Yemen is the hottest statesman talking about attacking facilities in Israel, even pro-Iranian uh, pro militias as well. Every day they just also make statements about get, uh, uh, attacks by strong facilities in Israel. So the difference is if Iran was involved. So the kind of um, reacts so far, I've seen like Russia, many European uh, uh, airlines, companies have just started the plot to Iran, which means, you know, there is like an imminent attack. Let's talk first to Zach Anders, a reporter in Gaza. He broke the news of the strike in Damascus that led us to this possible escalation. Welcome to you, Zach. Hello again, John. Hi. You're, you're talking to us now live from the border city of Gaza City. Can you tell me, though, from there, how is Israel dealing with this possibility of an attack from Iran, possibly direct, possibly involving its many proxies? Yeah, Israeli sources believe that this isn't going to look like some sort of grand attack that's going to target civilian centers. 
But that doesn't discount the concerns of their military installations that are in the heart of some very populated areas. Uh, today, uh, just a few hours ago, actually, the Iranian regime tweeting on uh, Twitter or X uh, the images and uh, actual uh, geolocation of the port of Haifa. Uh, this is an Israeli naval base. It's very close to the Lebanon border. And it was one of those targets that Hassan Nasrallah of Hezbollah has, in just about every speech he's given since this conflict began, called Haifa one of the uh, points of uh, uh, Israeli weakness, that Hezbollah has the capability to strike these places uh, like Haifa, like uh, some of the other military installations in Israel's north, the Northern Command Base, some of the air bases, Ramat David. Uh, so there, there are certainly areas, uh, of course, Israel is a very small country, so wherever you go, there's going to be civilian areas around these military bases. But it's the belief tonight that as this concern is at its highest and even the U.S. Uh, Central Command uh, General has flown into Israel and is supposedly going to be helping coordinate some of the defense efforts that are taking place here across multiple arenas. You've got an array of air defense networks that the Israelis are employing, presumably with the U.S., land-based, sea-based, and some of the Air Force jets that have the ability to uh, shoot down some of these slower loitering drones or these uh, Shahid drones that Iran is so successful at making. So that's the concern tonight, is yes. that uh, military installations will be the target, potentially in the south of Israel as well, in a lot. Uh, but, but no one really can really say for certain how uh, is Iran's appetite, how big their appetite is uh, to provoke Israel into what would be presumably in a, a fairly intense response on Iranian soil. Well, in, indeed. Aaron, from the Israeli point of, point of view, Israel is very well defended against air attack and missile attack, especially with America saying they will be there doing, doing all that's necessary. But Hezbollah in the north, they have a, an enormous arsenal of rockets and missiles. And Israel, of course, we know how well armed Iran is. So, I mean, how confident can Israelis be at this really difficult, de delicate moment, Zach? You know, there's a confidence that emanates from all of the military sources, but the everyday Israelis have been watching every single headline intensely over the last six months and recognize that Hezbollah has been able to hit military points in the north, and even the Houthis have been able to hit ships in uh, the Red Sea as yeah. well. And uh, so it's not a given that if uh, you are to uh, be attacked that you'd be able to shoot down everything even though israel has the world's one of the world's most advanced air defense arrays um, i think one of the things that stands out uh, as in my conversations with uh, some inside the israeli uh, the, uh, the idf is that the concern for a saturation attack, which is when you try to just overwhelm the air defenses, is the most vulnerable that Israel would be uh, at that point. If Hezbollah was to launch, it's believed through U.S. estimates that they have tens of thousands of rockets and missiles and then thousands of drones, if they were to launch a, a, a fair majority or as much as they could muster at once and time it with say attacks in the south as well that would put a serious strain on the air defenses and you would presumably have uh, the majority of aerial targets shot down but not all of them right so while israel and while it's, while it's american allies and others watch carefully for any kind of uh, of threat from iran or from hezbollah on the red sea and so on the gaza conflict is still so delicately poised and america will be hoping for some sort of breakthrough on the on the negotiations that have been I don't know, stop start faltering and then beginning again what's the latest on that uh, zach well the latest is in tonight we're seeing a lot of movement on this hostage deal and the greatest headline coming out of uh, wall street journal report from u.s sources that the potential for getting a deal done hinges on the proof of life of elderly uh, women and children hostages that they're trying to get to that number of 40 hostages and that Hamas has not been able to produce a list of those that are alive that could even be provided for an exchange. And the uh, Wall Street Journal report has uh, sources inside the Biden administration that believes that the majority of hostages are dead and have been either killed were killed on October 7th or have since been killed 
inside Gaza. They don't put a specific number on how many they think are still alive, but uh, that speaks to the strain of these hostage negotiations as Israel has made several concessions over the last week and a half, uh, including adding additional Palestinian prisoners, allowing people to move, civilians to move back into the city that's behind me right now, Gaza City, and in the north of the Gaza Strip. And apparently this was the last element of that hostage deal was Hamas had been holding out in providing proof of life or a list of those who are alive. And now that we're at this stage, we're seeing reports that Hamas is unable to do so. And if, I guess we can only I know, calculate and speculate about this finally, Zach, if those reports are right and the hostages are for the most part dead, that would surely have the effect of just making the, the, the Israeli attitude to this, let alone that of Benjamin Netanyahu, more militant. The, the only thing that stands out at this juncture is that if you get to a point where the hostages are, are the majority are presumed dead and you have potentially just, you know, the, the men that have been held, held out, uh, I, I would expect to see, and we've heard the Israeli commentators, the statements from the defense minister as well, that um, they feel like they have, in some aspects, held back in their military campaign. Uh, I would be concerned to see what the, the conflict, what the warfare looks like inside the Gaza Strip, uh, should they not have any, any hope that hostages are still alive, that this isn't their, quote, rescue mission. That's a dark thought. Zach, always good to get your perspective there uh, live uh, from Gaza City. Now, let me just get the, uh, the the assessment, the expertise on board of Catherine Felt, the World Affairs Editor at the Times. Hello to you, Catherine. Hi, John. Hi. I mean, looking at it now from uh, the, the America's perspective for a moment, Joe Biden saying, gave this ironclad promise of support for for Israel at this time of threat from Iran. One imagines the White Horse must White House must be imagining and hoping that could deter an Iranian attack before it happens, because a direct conflict between Iran and Israel with America involved too, that would be a war Iran cannot win. Well, I think it's interesting that Zach in his assessment there talked more about what Hezbollah might do towards Israel rather than Iran itself. Uh, there's never been a direct uh, confrontation between uh, Iran and Israel of this kind. It's always been through um, Iranian proxies like Hezbollah or Hamas. So I think that the the stakes of it being a direct conflict are so overwhelmingly high yeah. uh, that almost mitigates against it. I mean, the, the US rush to be by Israel's side, I think also is linked to that and, and the hope of, uh, of a deterrence or a sort of calming down of things. Um, but I think we also need to see this in the context of how uh, US Israeli relations have been over the past week um, since, or, or slightly more actually, since the killing of those uh, seven aid workers in Gaza mm. and a pretty frosty conversation, as we know, between Joe Biden and Benjamin Netanyahu, in which he ordered him uh, more or less to open the gates of, of Gaza and let the aid in, which still has not happened. Yes. So uh, you want to essentially, when look, you know, looking at a threat from Iran, you want to rebalance that and not leave Tehran thinking that, uh, that, that there's a split to be exploited, a, a lasting split to be exploited. Yes, and um, when we discuss the, the, the various... Iranian proxies. We're, we're still looking at a formidable array of force, aren't we? In the north, to the north of Israel, the, the Hezbollah with, with an enormous arsenal of, of rockets. We've seen the Houthis launching their strikes in the in the Red Sea. We've seen other attacks launched out of Iraq from Islamist proxies. They they have an enormous amount of firepower. They do. I mean, let, let's not forget that four years ago when the Americans took out uh, General Soleimani, uh, the Iranian general in Erbil that um, Iran did retaliate with the largest ever ballistic missile strike on U.S. Uh, air ba uh, military bases in Iraq it actually didn't kill any American soldiers, um, which is intriguing. You could think it might have been balanced in that way so as to show off firepower, but not uh, so much that it would provoke uh, a retaliation on Iranian soil. I think the key uh, proxy here to look at is Hezbollah. I mean, obviously the Houthis are remarkably able to strangle uh, shipping in the Red Sea. They've been able to uh, launch um, a sort of mass drone attacks on Saudi Arabia in the past. But the, the people with the real firepower in this arena are, are in southern Lebanon, Hezbollah. 
Um, now, many in Israel's military are very concerned about Israel's ability to take on uh, Hezbollah at the same time as uh, the conflict in Gaza. However, it's been quite some time since Hamas have been in a position to fire rockets out of Gaza into Israel. So this was probably being factored in by the Israeli military planners uh, that when they launched that attack in Syria, that they may be more capable now of taking on uh, a full-throated Hezbollah response than they would have had they tried it six months ago. Can I just get your thoughts then on the you know, the potential implications of uh, of this conflict escalating in, in this way. In political terms, destabilization of, of countries like Egypt and Jordan, and economic terms, the effects on markets and on the Gulf states, for example. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> it's not a great uh, outlook. No, in, in, in no, it's hard to see how anyone can benefit from this. Um, I mean, I think that... Uh, Perhaps one of the two places where we're seeing the least reason, um, well, I think we can write, write off Hamas in, in Gaza for reason um, since they launched that attack on October 7th, but we're not seeing much reason out of Tehran and we're particularly not seeing a great deal of reason out of the offices of the Israeli prime minister. He's gone a, a, against... Uh, several of his own uh, members of his war cabinet. Meanwhile, he's under pressure from his own right wing. who have threatened to collapse his government um, if he doesn't continue the conflict and, and uh, attack Rafa in uh, Gaza. So there's a lot of things to be balanced here. I mean, the other thing that we've got sort of essentially on hold is uh, this rapprochement that was ongoing between much of the Arab world and Israel that mm. the, uh, the Hamas attacks uh, interfered with. And Saudi has actually emerged as quite a vocal uh, leader of uh, attempts to calm things down in the region and stop them from from spiraling out of control, because yes. it's 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 very hard to see who at all could benefit from that happening. And, and Catherine, just a final word from you on on hopes, not just America's hopes, an awful lot of people's hopes on some sort of. I don't know, arrangement being reached through a hostage deal. Maybe, as America discusses, maybe leading to something more of a lasting peace. If, as Zach was telling us, there were these reports saying that maybe most of those hostages are dead now. If that turns out to be the case, then is it your assumption that all bets would be off? It's hard to say. I mean, one of the uh, strongest political um, constituencies in Israel right now is the families of the hostages who've been putting an enormous amount of pressure on Benjamin Netanyahu. If, if it turns out that uh, that their loved ones are dead and are dead because they weren't rescued earlier, then I would say that that makes things very difficult for him. Um, what we know is that Hamas have said they aren't able to confirm whether those people are alive in those numbers and who they are. This is also partly the fact that Hamas has never been clear where all these people were, as far as we can tell. Um, we know of those reports that civilians in Gaza and also other militant groups came through the fence that day on October 7th and took hostages. Um, and effectively, what's going on in Gaza right now, the, the fact that the place is more or less flattened, is probably making it even harder for uh, for Hamas to ascertain where these hostages are or if they're alive. And again, a lot of these hostages, we don't know if, if they are dead. We don't know how they died yet. Uh, and as I say, the, the, the families are very anxious to know uh, what's happened and to hold you know, to, to, to hold responsible, not just Hamas, but any uh, Israeli leaders who they think have not prioritised bringing their loved ones home. So, Rachel uh, and Stefan, I don't want to sound alarmist, because people, I think, maybe rightly some of the time, expect broadcasts to look for any excuse to sound alarmist when we're talking about the global strategic picture. But the idea of an Iranian attack, direct attack, or a big attack through proxies on Israel, that's a pretty alarming idea. Uh, yeah, Rachel. absolutely. Um, and I think it's not alarmist, it's alarming. And I think that's why Joe Biden has taken the stance he had and used this language of ironclad support, even though only a few days previously he'd made clear he wasn't happy with the way in which um, Netanyahu was acting in Gaza. Um, but the stakes, as Catherine Philp said, are just enormous if you end up with this uh, a war between these two major uh, powers. It would be really frightening. And I think the danger for Biden is that he's now aligning himself so clearly with Israel. Does he 
America also get dragged in if Iran does do something? What does America do in response? Yeah. And then the Iranians must be calculating very carefully how far do they push it? Do they go for an Israeli consulate or embassy? Uh, a military which, target, a civilian target. Or a military target, target civilian Stephen. target. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, speaking to a lot of foreign policy people in the last six months since the attack on on Israel by Hamas. I mean, this has been a big fear of there being an accidental world war, of, you know, countries and other states being pulled into it by one by one, similar to World War One. We end up in a place where we have, you know, a global conflict of, you know, horrific proportions. And I think that this is a very alarming thing. You know, we, when we have a, talking about a direct attack from Iran on Israel, it would be unprecedented if they didn't do it through one of their proxies. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and let, let's, you know, let, let's see how this plays out. But I think that Biden coming forward and giving out this information is trying to, as uh, Kat Phillips said, trying to, you know, dissuade Iran, trying to make them hold back because they can come forward now and, as the US has done on previous occasions, show their uh, show their intelligence and try to put this forward early to try to sort of make them think twice about how far they'll go and how far the yeah. US would retaliate. Well, I'm Stefan Rich, let's all consult now, a, a strategic analyst and expert. Robin Wright's on the line, who is a foreign policy analyst and author of journalist, joint fellow at the US Institute of Peace and Woodrow Wilson Centre. Hello to you, Robin. Great to be with you, John. Hi. Can we start with Iran and, and the, the Middle East? I mean, that, those were strong words from President Biden, weren't they? Clearly intended to give the deterrent that's needed at this stage. Because if it comes to a, well, certainly a direct conflict between Iran and Israel, with America involved as well, or even a major, major onslaught from the various, and there are many, Iranian proxies, it's a war Iran can't win. It's a war Iran can't, can't win, but it also has a, an arsenal and missiles and drones that have reached something called overmatch, the uh, capability of Iran and its allies, or even just its allies, unleashed what they have, that Iran, uh, Israel couldn't protect simply through Iron Dome. Uh, look, President Biden is trying at the same time to get Israel to do more on Gaza, to engage in a ceasefire and to get the hostages out. At the same time that he's pressuring Netanyahu, the prime minister, he's also trying to offer some kind of sense of security. And that's a tough balancing act. The big question right now is whether the United States can negotiate some kind of ceasefire to preempt Israel, uh, to, sorry, to preempt Iran, uh, to, to give it a sense that it, its allies in Gaza may have a chance to survive, yes. uh, to do those things. The second question is, will this be a repeat of what happened when the United States uh, assassinated General Qasem Soleimani in 2020, who was the leader of the Revolutionary Guards Quds Force that ran foreign operations. Uh, Iran retaliated against the United States, uh, launching dozens of missiles, the first time the U.S. had been attacked by missiles since 1953. And more than 100 Americans uh, suffered traumatic brain injuries. But it stopped there. And the question is, will Iran strike back, but also send a diplomatic message, as it did at the time, to say, this is what we intend to do. This is our retaliation, and we do not intend to take it further. So there, you know, as alarmist as we all are right now, yes. the question is, how does this play out? I mean, I do want to bring in Stefan and and and, and Richard on this, uh, but if it came to. And it would be more likely, I guess, on the balance of probabilities for Iran to use those many proxies. They've got the Houthis in, in Yemen. They've got Hezbollah in Lebanon. They've got various Islamist forces in countries, including, including Iraq. If they threw them all in at the same time, would there then be a possibility of a counter-strike against Iran itself? Well, I think that that is a terrifying prospect, John. I mean, because you would have in that... Uh, in that situation, you would have Hamas from one side, Syria, uh, uh, Lebanon from the north, from Hezbollah, and also Yemen also from the south. There would be an all-out attack on Israel. It would mm. like almost be an all-out war, and you know, and and, and such a wide-ranging thing. Mm. And I think that Israel is in a state right now where they're in a state of war already. They're already mm. very, very much on a war footing. So they may be more than you know for a very, very long time yeah. minded to retaliate yeah. in a way that's very aggressive. When a, a massive, more... on, a massive onslaught in, yeah, against. Well, I think I think we were hearing out on. It may be more likely that the, the, the targets chosen by those proxies would be military targets than civilian targets. But Hezbollah have got thousands upon thousands of rockets and missiles. If they launch them at Israel, they would really test their their air defences. What do you think about that, Robin? If, if, if it was through proxies, and there are many of them, some of them very heavily armed, 
would Israel, would America contemplate an attack back at Iran? That would be the, the real escalation, do you think? The United States is not going to get involved unless its forces are attacked. Right. The, the challenge for Washington is that it has deployed now two carrier uh, uh, warships, two carrier battle groups, uh, in the Mediterranean, in the Red Sea, because of the many challenges. And will it get sucked in? The more forces it has in the region, the more it also becomes targets. The U.S. was attacked uh, peacekeepers in Lebanon in 1983, the largest loss of U.S. military life since World War II. And so there's a vulnerability for the United States as well. I, I strongly believe it is intent on avoiding any kind of direct conflict. Yes. But do, do its warships use their missile defense systems to prevent something from hitting Israel? You know, does it get sucked in in a way that it doesn't want to? Uh, I think, you know, this is this is uh, one of the most strategic moments I have ever covered, and I've covered every war since 1973. Right. The re real dangers here, in part because of the emotions, passions running high in Israel. They've been attacked, they, the kind of atrocities carried out by um, Hamas, and they feel an existential threat in a way that the United mm -hmm. States doesn't. And so their instinct in, in reacting may be bigger than the United States was in 2020 when, you know, they wanted to eliminate a threat in General Soleimani, um, but they didn't want the war to go any further once there was a, a counterstrike. Right. I mean, look, as, as difficult, as perilous a position as, as one can certainly remember, and more a period longer than one can remember. We haven't even gone to Ukraine and the Pacific yet. So on the Middle East and, and Iran, Rachel Sylvester. Um, Robin, I'm really interested in how you think Biden defines ironclad support. So if it's not the involvement of American forces directly, what exactly is he talking about? And how does the White House um, square that with this kind of sense of anxiety and unease about the way in which the Israeli government is um, conducting the campaign in Gaza and the growing political backlash um, among voters in America? Yes, this is a very important moment politically for the president as well as he navigates the crisis in the Middle East. Um, the United States has weapons or tools besides its missiles or, or its missile defense systems. It also can provide intelligence, strategic guidance. It can coordinate with the Israelis. Um, there are cyber tools. There are all kinds of things that if the United States wanted to send a signal to Iran. But I think the administration is actually, it's reached out to four uh, Arab countries and had their foreign ministers contact Iran to say, don't do it, you know, limit limit your response. Uh, and so I think there are a lot of things happening in the background, not all of which we're aware of, whether it's on diplomacy or whether it's in the kind of um, tangential tools that the United States has to try to ensure that this does not go any further. And this is the moment where you could either get a ceasefire in one hand and, and you know, chart a path forward to prevent an escalation, or we go full out. And and finding that middle road, um, limiting the damage, is going to be incredibly tricky. Okay, before, real... you know, Robin, before we move on, just just the last word on this, on this this aspect of the of the dis the discussion. It's been reported in America um, that it may well be the case that the the hostages have mostly been killed; that they are not alive. As and when, if that turns out to be true, as and when that becomes becomes apparent. What would the implications of that be? Would we not be looking at the full fury? We've seen a good deal of fury to this point, but even to a greater extent, the fury of Israel unleashed and hopes of a, of a, of a deal, hostages, which we do not have yet, leading to any kind of longer-term agreement, surely that would just evaporate. Look, uh, the last hostage swap, which I think was in 2016, involved one Israeli life in exchange for more than 1,000 Palestinian prisoners. In Israel, as in the United States, every life is particularly important. And uh, I think that, you know, we all know that that um, no, a number, some say more than 30 of the hostages, have died since October 7th. But the fact that there are roughly 100 still held, even if some of those have died, every single life is going to be important. And you see that on the streets. Uh, among Israelis who are protesting, you know, an end of this war or a ceasefire to get the hostages out. So I, I'm not sure that as long as there's a single Israeli held, that um, that Israel will not feel some kind of investment in getting them out. War in Gaza could escalate to a wider Middle East conflict.
Gerald Michael Feierstein, or former U.S. ambassador to Yemen under President Barack Obama, uh, is with us. Uh, and, and Gerald, you were also uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs, so you know this region well. Where do you think we're at at the moment? Because the tension's being ratcheted up, isn't it? Well, it's uh, it, it's certainly concerning. There's there's no question that uh, that we've seen a series of uh, very provocative uh, moves on Israel's side, uh, uh, targeting uh, Hezbollah, uh, targeting Iranian senior Iranian uh, IRGC Quds Force leaders, uh, and so uh, it is a, a moment where there is a lot to be worried about. Yeah, I see that. Um... Uh, administration officials uh, in Washington and Biden administration, they, they say Iran is planning a, quote, larger than usual aerial attack on Israel in the coming days. What do you think this means, larger than usual? Well, of course, Hezbollah has a lot of capabilities. They have a lot of missiles. They have a lot of drones. They have a lot of weapons that they could use. Uh, and uh, certainly if you're launching attacks from Lebanon or from Syria, uh, they could pretty much cover all of uh, of Israel. So uh, that would be uh, one possibility. The Israelis seem to uh, be particularly concerned about the possibility of some kind of uh, missile launch from Iran itself, uh, and they have uh, indicated that they would retaliate if there was such a, a strike. So, um, so you, there's been this kind of of uh, a shadow war, tit for tat, uh, going on between Hezbollah and Israel for some months now. Uh, I think the concern is that uh, there may be some expansion, acceleration of of those kinds of attacks. I was looking at the quote from the Supreme Leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei, and he said, when they attack the consulate, it is as if they attacked our soil. The evil regime made a mistake and must be punished, and it shall be. So given that statement, why are analysts so sure that Iran doesn't want to widen the war? Because that's what we're hearing from analysts here in this country and in the U.S. Yes, and that's been the, the, the view uh, from, from the early days of the Gaza conflict. Uh, the Iranians have been pretty clear. They've said it publicly. Um, they have apparently said it privately to, to senior U.S. officials. Uh, that they do not want to be drawn into into this uh, this war right now. They've managed to um, uh, keep uh, Hezbollah uh, pretty much out of it, except, as I, I mentioned, there is this kind of tit-for-tat uh, uh, um, firing between Israel and, and southern Lebanon. Uh, when, uh, when some of their uh, proxies in Syria and Iraq uh, hit, uh, a U.S. facility and killed some of our service people. Uh, they also uh, were clear at that time that they were going to uh, ensure that that didn't get repeated. And since then, it has not been. So so they have done what they could do uh, to try to make sure that, uh, that nobody had any excuse or reason uh, to come after them directly. Mm -hmm. And is this because they fear if uh, the U.S., or Israel decided so they could hit Tehran, they could essentially bring that regime to an end? Yeah, I don't know if they would bring the regime to an end, and, and I suspect that they wouldn't go uh, you know, against Tehran itself, but they could certainly do a lot of damage uh, to Iran's military infrastructure, to its uh, missile and and. Uh, and other capabilities, uh, you know, and conceivably uh, even try to hit some of their nuclear sites. So uh, I, I suspect that if there is retaliation against Iran, it would be more targeted against their military capabilities and civilian populations. Richard, you, you argue in your uh, piece of writing for The Telegraph today that if Iran strikes, Britain must take it on too. Britain must stand alongside Washington and take Iran on too. Um, give me your thought process behind that, because many Britons will say, I don't think it's wise for us to think about becoming involved in what potentially could be a huge escalation in the Middle East. Yeah, I think it's more likely to be an even huger escalation if uh, Israel is simply left to its own devices to absorb. Could be a significant 
Iranian attack and then strike back. I think that's potentially going to be even more problematic and lead to even greater hostilities. Let's not forget that Britain already fighting alongside the US in the Red Sea, trying to deal with the Iranian proxies, the Houthis, who have been attacking international shipping. And it's right and proper they should do, because uh, the, 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 the attacks on freedom of movement in the Red Sea are an attack on, on our country, on all countries that, uh, that need that movement. <clears throat> in turn, on itself, we're also culpable for a large element of the conflict that's taking place now in the Middle East. Not, not totally responsible, we have culpability. The US, the UK, France, Germany, other countries have been appeasing Iran for, for many years now, really since President Biden uh, assumed office and did his best to try and resurrect President Obama's very, very flawed nuclear deal. And in order to do that, he, he with, our, with our agreement, our support, he released billions of dollars of frozen assets to Iran, turned a blind eye to too many Iranian acts of aggression. Uh, and, and in that, encouraged what's going on now. All of the attacks taking place against Israel from and Syria, Yemen, from the West Bank, from Gaza, from Iraq, all of those are being done by Iranians, pro proxies funded by money yeah. that we agreed could be released well, to there Iran. Is a... On top of that, um, but the last home, the last Home Secretary said that the IRGC, part of the Iranian government, represents the greatest threat to the UK. So it's quite that we should be helping to contain and deal with Iran's uh, aggression mm. against Israel. Shouldn't we try and be a peace broker, though? Is there any other way um, for us to do this um, apart from the threat of conflict? I understand what you're saying, and if there was, I think it should be done. But but you 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 cannot uh, broker peace with a country like Iran. Iran Iran will not respond to diplomacy. It will not respond to um, to mediation. Uh, Turkey, for example, has already tried mediating with Iran without success over this issue. Mm. Um, the, the the only the only I'm, I'm sorry to say, and too many, too few people are the dynamics in the Middle East, but the language that they understand, that Iran understands, its theocratic regime, is strength. Now, I would hope that if Britain, France, Germany, the United States are willing to strongly stand up and at least show that they're willing to support Israel in this, that might have a deterrent yeah. effect. It's possible. So but a large really coalition. Yeah. Not, not pleading. Yeah, a large coalition of Western countries, you know, pressing upon Iran... Um, maybe a possibility. Um, I want to know what you think of the comments of Marco Rubio, the Florida senator today. He's also vice president of the US Senate Intelligence Committee. And uh, he has said that Israel will respond instantly if Iran strikes. Isma uh, Israel's going to respond instantly with an even more severe counterattack inside of Iran. What happens next, he says, is the most dangerous Middle East moment since 1973. What do you think of that? I, th I think he's got a very good point. Yeah, I, th I think I think he has a, make, makes a good point. But it, but it's necessary to respond with great strength. If, if if let's say Iran carries out some kind of significant attack against Israel, and it's not clear, there's indications it might, whether it's from Iranian territory or from from Lebanon. It's it's there are indications. But if it does happen. Uh, and there is a, a limited, a proportionate response. I think that that will encourage Iran to do it yeah. again. The response needs to be disproportionate. It needs to be more severe than the attack on mm. Israel itself. I understand your approach. Just briefly, uh, Richard, tell us how you think it's most likely that uh, Iran will retaliate that attack on Israel. How will they do it? Well, we can't be sure, obviously, but there are a number of different ways. The three most likely, I think, that perhaps the most likely is for Iran to carry out a bombing of an Israeli embassy somewhere around the world, which it's done before on a number of occasions. Secondly, it's likely that it will launch missile and drone attacks from Lebanon using its proxy Hezbollah. And thirdly, I think the least likely, but also possible, is that they will carry out an attack from 
Iran itself on, onto Israeli territory. I think that would be very, very risky for them uh, because, of course, it could attract a strong Israeli, possibly also U.S. response, mm. and, and, and that would threaten regime stability in Tehran, which is their overall priority. But any one of those three things, or po possibly other options, could we could see happening potentially in uh, in, in the days. But I, I would I would really emphasise that. It's only strength that is going to prevent further escalation. If we show weakness as we have in the past, then there will almost certainly greater escalation than we're going to see anyway.